Yeah, no, as soon, so as soon as we hit record, then the noises start. So now a little landscaping, a little, little construction. Uh, have you had it uh, through the pandemic? Has it been hard kind of doing stuff like this? Yeah. Weirdly, it's gotten easier because it's quieter in our studio because oh. we share the building with other tenants yeah. and the pandemic happens and then a lot of them work from home. So now yeah. the building's quiet. Yeah. So that was kind of nice. First of all, thanks for joining me, Sundar. I'm sure you're extremely busy at this particular time of year. So uh, I appreciate the time. One of my favorite parts of doing this uh, talking tech series is I get to talk to people who have a unique perspective on tech. And I feel like as a CEO of Google and Alphabet, you're almost required to have like some vision of a future. Uh, I'm curious, the number one question I always get is what's the next big thing? So I'll just leave you with this number one FAQ. What is, what is the future hold? What are your, your big visions of the next five to 10 years of tech? It's a big question. Um, you know, the, in some ways, we tried to communicate aspects of the at I.O. yesterday. You know, I've always felt at Google and at Alphabet, we are working on deeper computer science and AI in a way by which you can, you can make real advances, but then take that and apply it practically to be helpful, be it small moments or bigger moments. I see a lot of potential in the advances in AI, but it's equally important that you have a real framework by which you're applying it. Right. And that's why when we say helpful, we have four attributes we focus on, knowledge, success, health, and happiness. And I actually think through the work we do, the products I see, and it could be something like in maps, you know, adding eco routes or detecting breaking moments and heartbreaking moments and making changes. Or it could be big like the mammography example or, or derm assist and so on. But you know, it's thinking through with that framework in mind. Definitely. I think AI comes up a lot, especially when you watch a Google keynote. AI is sort of part of the solution for almost every problem you guys solve. Uh, I wonder, I, I assume you have to have a pretty optimistic view about the future of AI and, and the structures you want to keep in place around it. But how much do you think about the potential negatives or potential downsides as AI gets more advanced? Because I've talked to people who have a much more negative view about it. No, no, I, I think it's fair to be worried about, worried about any, any new technology. You know, technology has dual sides and I feel humanity's journey has been e at each stage. How do you figure out to harness technology in a way that benefits society? Right. And, and for AI is so profound, I, I think that that'll be true for AI too. But I think the way you do it is by working at it, making progress, uh, being transparent about it, engaging in conversations. And over time, governments and there have to be other frameworks to evolve it, yeah. Yeah, should it be up to governments or should it be up to those because this is a problem we see all the time, is people who don't know as much about the thing are in charge of regulating the thing. Mm -hmm. Should it be up to companies like Google to be as responsible as possible, or should there also be government structure around AI? I think a combination of all that. I think companies have to definitely you know, be responsible because they are often developing technology early and you're at the cutting edge of technology. And it takes a while for governments to, you know, think about it and address. Yeah. But I think public-private partnerships are important. Academia plays a strong role, acad academic institutions and research. Over time for something like AI, you would need no different for something as big as climate change. You have concepts like Paris Agreement. You know, you would need global frameworks because uh, to, to, uh, to think about it. But I am optimistic. I mean, I think, you know, I see the benefits of all of the, how all of this can impact. And, you know, we have worked together hard to address issues in the past, so. I think it's easy to be optimistic because there's so many good, cool things happening from AI. One of my favorite announcements from you guys was Google sort of ad adapting their computational photography to better account for different skin tones. Mm -hmm. And it seems like such a small thing but it affects so many people. I mean, part of the reason I use the cameras that I do is because it can handle this latitude and, and different skin tones, and I like the way they look. But I'm curious if you feel like there's other quick, practical applications of, of AI in the smartphone world, kind of like that. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I was excited about Project Douglas. You know, my daughter had the same reaction. I was 
you know, she literally had the same reaction when she first heard about it. She's like, was talking about the pictures and she felt, you know, she wasn't represented correctly. And, and so I'm glad we addressed it and there's more work to be done there. We have had the same experience with accessibility. So live captioning mm -hmm. videos and you can do it on device and you can, and the thing I always like about these things is even if you think of it as a feature to help the disabled community, it has wide applicability beyond that as well. You know, you could be in a meeting and you want to listen to a video and the captioning still works, right? And, or in a crowded place and so on. So I think all of this is much wider applicability too. Definitely. The other AI part that was a little crazy was, I think it's called Lambda. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, L-A-M-D-A. -A. But it, you, you demonstrated this uh, conversational aspect of AI where it sort of uses information to answer questions about itself. So the demo was talking to Pluto which is pretty cool, you know, Pluto gets to defend itself, maybe it's a little underrated, but I, I imagine, like, my brain immediately went to, well, what other things could you synthesize a conversation with? And I, I went straight to, like, people, like, other existing people. Are there lines you won't cross with things like Project Lambda, where, like, should you not be allowed to synthesize conversation with someone who's alive, or how do you think about, like, where Lambda can go? Um you know, I want to stress Lambda is still research, right? Yeah. And, you know, so we're pushing the boundary there. This is why, let me step, this is why we, you know, articulated our AI principles very clearly and publicly so that we have a framework to think through anything like this. When it comes to product, I think, you know, it's really important, like AI is not ever used in an impersonation way or, you know, or, you have to think through the right constructs for how it is used. And so we are much more focused on using Lambda to understand language deeper. Yeah. And, and in the context, you can imagine talking to Google Assistant. Yeah. So first of all, search today, if it understood language deeper, or even in YouTube, when we are trying to understand what's in a video, right? The fact that we can understand language deeper would make a big difference. So that's the primary purpose. But in, the, in, in conversing with an assistant, we can make conversations much more natural. So the intent isn't to, uh, you know, Pluto and a paper airplane are more benign examples, and, but you know, we would have to have ethical principles and guidelines uh, around anything we develop there. What smartphone do you have in your pocket and why? That's, got, that's probably the number one question people want me to ask you. You know, it changes a lot. Uh, sure. It depends on the day of the week. Uh, probably not as many as you play around with. I but, might be. But someday, uh, you know, it may not be too far off either. But I do try out almost every phone, at least for a little bit. Uh, I shouldn't say every phone, most phones. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, but uh, right now in my pocket is a pixel. I should, it's a pixel. I should pull it out. I yeah, think, I was going to so say, it could be do. any pixel. So, okay. you know, it's a... It's, it's a Pixel, but it's, it's the released version of the Pixel now. But I, you know, I've enjoyed using the S21 and, uh, you know, and I check out everything that comes in the market, a OnePlus maybe, and, you know, play around with it. Uh, iPhones across, our products work across everything. So I'm, yeah. I'm testing a lot of devices. Yeah, it feels like if you're, if you're in, I mean, you started at Google with Chrome and then obviously with Android and now overseeing everything. Does it ever feel like you're too in the weeds to appreciate how other people might use the product? Because when I'm making a video, for example, I might spend five, six hours on an edit and then I, I'm watching it back looking for little things and I might kind of lose the bigger picture of the person who jumps in for the first time. If you're using Android 12 and new features coming out and you're, you're testing it on, on whatever daily phone it is, does that ever feel like a challenge to, to step back and remember, like people have to use this for the first time and how they'll interact with it, or do you feel like you've sort of got that down to a science? No, no, well, what are you talking about? It's, it's, it's the art of product management, I think, stepping back. So there's a difference between, hey, translation is exciting, we can build it in Chrome, to how would you do it in a way in which for most people it kind of naturally works. Yeah. And, and designing it are two different things, I think. And so there's a lot of that. 
but I actually find your point even broader. A uh, lot of the way when I do reviews with other teams, the perspective I almost always bring, and it could be anyone else in my position is, you know, because the teams are so in the effort of what they are doing, yeah. it's, it's tough for them to sometimes see the forest uh, instead of the trees. And, and so it's a lot of what real life is about, I think. I want to ask about your, your like overall view of you know, becoming the CEO of, of Google. Like you grew up in India, and you've mentioned didn't have access to the internet or a computer for a long time, and then you came to the US and you had access to the internet. Are there things that still surprise you about like the advancements in tech and accessibility today, even though you've seen so much of a difference between the beginning of your career and, and now? I think for me, because growing up, every moment was discreet. Like I had to wait a long time to get something and then I saw the impact of it. Right. You know, so waited five years on a wait list to get a rotary telephone, right? And you may not know what a rotary telephone heard is. Heard about those. No, I heard about those. But, you know, kind of changed the life uh, for me, my parents, uh, in our streets, people would come to our home to kind of use it to talk to their family and friends. So I've always had that, uh, you know, the impact of how it can change uh, people's lives. Where it most directly impacted me is I got inspired by the One Laptop Per Child project, uh, which, uh, which was being done by Negroponte at the time out of MIT. And I today look back at Chromebooks or you know, Android phones, and to me it feels like you know, it's, it's an explicit continuation of that journey, which, which was inspiring to me. Right. Uh, here's maybe an interesting question. Uh, the tech CEO has sort of become like a, its own genre of celebrity in a weird way, in a way that it probably wasn't even thought about 10, 20 years ago. Do you think about that at all? Like, obviously, there's this uh, this new curiosity about the, some of the most powerful companies in the world and the people that run them. Um, being a pretty understated guy, I would assume you're probably not all about the spotlight, but I'm curious what you feel about that. You know, I, I recognize the responsibility which comes with it, uh, you know, the scale at which tech is working in the world. Uh, I think I think there is an importance to it and rightfully there is accountability that comes with it and I think the importance of engaging and explaining yourselves internally and externally, uh, uh, that comes with it. But beyond that, I don't think too much about it and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is, is not how I approach it, yeah. That's fair, I like that answer. <laughs> uh, so let's say you fast forward, let's go 50 years into the future, you're retired from from Google, from tech, how do you want your your fingerprint here in the tech world to be remembered? You know, uh, I would I would love 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 it to be about you know enabling radically more access to both information and computing to more people. Um, that's a big part of what I think about. Uh, you know, really uh, driven by it. But beyond that, you know, I've always been interested in. Uh, driving deeper uh, technological progress, um, and and the uh, obviously you have to take that and translate it into product and business success, right? And it goes hand in hand. Uh, but I think you know driving AI forward responsibly, uh, you know, is a big part of what I think and work a lot on. For sure. All right. Well, I mean, I'm looking forward to a lot of the new stuff that's coming out. Very excited about Android 12 and like all the customization and, and what is it called? Something U. Material U. Material U. Like that's it's a cool idea. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. But thanks for the time. I appreciate the interview and hopefully we get to do it again sometime. All right. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks.